Hello, doing a video on brain stuff. Antonio Damasio, a quest to understand consciousness. It's a TED talk, so yeah, it's kind of just bullshit. So the first three quarters of it was just basic stuff, you know. Uh, can't, can't even describe it. it was so basic. It was just, and it was just kind of boring and nothing. So here he is talking about consciousness in front of an audience, and he's making consciousness incredibly boring. Ugh. But anyway, um, so now he's on this, this is the, the what you call the midbrain, but this is the, the, basically the reptilian origins of the brain. Uh, the, you know, the, the spinal cord, and the junk on top of it. Um, but anyway, so, so he's basically talking about the fact that these are basically in, input-output devices. Um, you know, one side is, is all about input. If you lose that, you're going to be you know, unconscious. Your the, your the rest of your brain can be working, it can be thinking things, imagining things, doing all kinds of things, but it'll never get anywhere. It'll never become conscious. It'll never communicate with the rest of the brain, so it'll just talk to nothing. It'll talk in empty space. You'll be composing sentences. You'll be saying, where am I? What's happening to me? Except those sentences will never be conscious. They'll never go anywhere. They'll just die in that other brain. And if this red part gets wiped out, are damaged, um, yeah, you're paralyzed and you're fucked, and that's gonna suck. Um, so yeah, no, no output then. So you have a full consciousness inside your head, but there's absolutely no way for it to communicate with the the rest of the reflexes that make you animated. <laughs> so the rest of the output reflexes are shut off, and you're fucked. Um, but yeah, this is the origins of consciousness by his own, you know, by him, by what he states in which your mind disappears, your consciousness disappears. Uh, what, what happens then actually is that you lose the grounding of the self, you have no longer access to any feeling of your own existence, and in fact there can be images going on, being formed in the cerebral cortex, except you don't know they're there. You have, you have in effect lost consciousness when you have damage to that red section of the brainstem. But if you consider the green part of the brain. Oh, sorry, I did it backwards. My mistake. Sorry. Simple model. Instead, nothing like that. Happened. Yeah, very simple. Looks kind of like a penis, right? So this is too simple a model. Obviously, the guy's full of shit because this is just a this is commonsensical kind of simple drawing kind of shit. You can't do that and explain brains, according to Fred. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It is that specific. So in that green component of the brainstem, if you damage it, and often it happens, what you get is complete paralysis, but your conscious mind is maintained. You feel, you know, you have a fully conscious mind that you can report very indirectly. This is a horrific condition, you don't want to see it, uh, and people are in fact imprisoned within their own bodies, but they do have a mind. There was a, a very interesting film one of the rare good films done about a situation like this by Julian Schnabel, some... some yeah, yeah, right. Rare good films. Now, they're all kind of good films when they're about this. It's the rest of the films that are rubbish. He's not, you know, second language English or something. I don't know. He does make mistakes. Anyway, um, but, uh, yeah, a real fun talk, right? <laughs> yeah, wow. Here's your, your, your 15 minutes of fame, and this is what you do with it. Oof. Not that, you know, not that he didn't already have fame and all that shit. Years ago, about a patient that was in that condition. So, now I'm going to show you a picture. I promise not to say anything about this, except this is to frighten you. It's just to tell you that in that red section of the brainstem, there are, to make it simple, all those little squares that correspond to modules that actually make brain maps of different aspects of our interior, different aspects of our body. They are exquisitely topographic and they are exquisitely interconnected in a recursive pattern. And yeah, so you'll see this is some of the stuff that was in the brain stem. And this is obviously the stuff at the high brain. And so he's just pointing out the, the connected parts. So this is the other brain stem nuclei. I uh, don't really know what that is, to tell you the truth, but regardless. Um, but yeah, it looks kind of like the tennis ball thing, right? Okay, so it's sort of a logic map here. Um, you know, input, output, you use the same. This is like the video card, and this is like the sound card. 
And this is the blah blah blah, and this is the CPU. Let's say, well, the CPU probably has to be really internal. That's really low, low, low. Um, and so the 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 cerebral cortex that would be like the software. That would be like the thing holding the software. So that's like the hard drive. Yeah, that's you know. So anyway, moving on. It is out of this and out of this tight coupling between the brain stem and the body that I believe, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. Uh, oh, well, you're not allowed to do that. No, 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 no. You can't be, you can't think you're right about something. No, 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 no. That you generate this mapping of the body that provides the grounding for the self and that comes in the form of feelings. There you go. So that's basically saying what I'm saying, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it doesn't matter though. Um, so, um, well, it's normal gone. feelings, by the way. So, what is the picture that we get here? Look at cerebral cortex. Look at brains. Boy, that looks way too simple to me, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, way too simple. It's only got three things in it: the body. It doesn't even show the body; it just points to it. Boy, that's way too simple. And look at body, and you get a picture of the interconnectivity. In wow, which... look at that. Wow, that makes it all much better now. Lines, and they're two different colors. Wow, okay, yeah, that's, whoa, gee, whoa, wow, 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 wow. No, that's really not all that impressive, is it? No, it isn't. You have the brain stem providing the grounding for the self in a very tight interconnection with the body, and you have the cerebral cortex providing the great spectacle of our minds with the... Yeah, so he's basically saying the, the cortex is just creating all the delusional nonsense that you have added on to the lizard. So you basically have a lizard, and because we have all this extra crap here, we can do a funky chicken dance, you see. So that's the difference. We can funky chicken, okay, where the lizard can't funky chicken. So all of this extra crap here enables us to do our little funky chicken before we stick our wiener in the vagina. Yeah. So, sorry, but yeah, that's all it's for. That's right. All this big fat, this is like the peacock. You should just put a peacock over this. Right? All of this crap has nothing to do with the survival of the organism or anything really interesting. It just has to do with the bullshitisms, the social interactions of gang warfare. See, we were a perfectly functional little individual and we had this little thing here, this little node of, of I'm a lizard. But to be a group of lizards, you need this crap because you need to have all these rules of social interaction and you have to be able to get along and you have to compromise and everybody has to have a different job title and everybody has to do different things and blah, blah, blah. So all this complexity is a product of being social jackasses. <laughs> yeah profusion of images that are in fact the contents of our minds and that we normally pay most attention to as we should because that's really the film that is rolling in our minds yeah see that's a good one see film that is rolling that's like my theater analogy but you know film that is rolling is good too you know and what happens is is like um we have made the, th we got Technicolor now, widescreen, we got rumble vision, all kinds of interesting add-ons to the film, right? In the 30s, it was just tickety, 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 the film ran, you know, and, 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 uh, and the light bulb is the brainstem, that's the light bulb. You know, the brainstem fucks up, yeah, you're not going to have no fucking movie, don't matter how much fancy film you're running, don't matter how fancy your projector is, no bulb, it ain't going anywhere. But look at the, the, the arrows, they're not there for looks, they're there because there's this very close interaction. You cannot have a conscious mind if you don't have the interaction between cerebral cortex and brainstem. You cannot have a conscious mind if you don't have the interaction between the brainstem and the body. Another thing that is interesting is that... Yeah, so it's basically the mixing bowl scenario, right? If you remember that drawing, it kind of had the arrows bouncing off the cortex, you know, just boom, 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 goes up red, comes back green, goes up red, comes back green. So real mixing bowl looking, yep, looks like a mixing bowl to me, it's just the cover for the brainstem, bingo, consciousness. Yep, you capture the light and you bounce it back into the brain as a sixth sense, which are your feelings. Hmm, yeah, that makes sense to me.
that the brainstem that we have. I mean the interpretation of the sense data, right? The sense data comes in in a crude form. You're not really feeling anything with your hand. Your hand isn't feeling anything like, oh, I feel it. Your brain's creating the illusion of feeling right there at the end of my fingers. My brain's creating that illusion. So it, what it has to do is it goes into the brain as raw data. It's just raw fucking jerky jerky electricity. And then it has to bounce off that mixing ball to come back at me as a, ooh, that's a sensation. It's shared with a variety of other species. So throughout vertebrates, the design of the brain stem is very similar to ours, which is one of the reasons why I think those other species have conscious minds like we do, except that they're not as rich as ours because they don't have a cerebral cortex like we do. Yeah, so it's not as rich, which means it doesn't funky chicken. But, you know, not as rich is a kind of a tricky word, right? I mean, their orgasm might be three times or ten times as rich. We don't, I have speculated, and I have, it's called speculation. For anybody who's confused, speculation means that you're just kind of talking ambiguously, like, okay, this might be the answer. Um, now I forgot the point. Damn. Oh yeah, that um, because of what we're doing with our brain, because of the fact that we have s essentially taken resources to store all of this vocabulary and all this other crap, that we might be incredibly sensually dull. That we might not be anywhere near as conscious as a great ape, or even lower animals might be incredibly, they might have incredibly intense feelings, because they're not wasting brain space on this crap. That's where the difference is, and I strongly disagree with the idea that consciousness should be cons considered as the great product of the cerebral cortex. Only the wealth of our minds is, not the very fact that we have a self that we can refer to our own existence. Right, so he just basically said, again, just as I've been saying, the consciousness, the rich, the, the consciousness, okay, isn't the cortex. It just isn't. The cortex is just what kind of dance you can dance, not the fact that you dance and like dancing. So you sort of can argue it's kind of like the retard thing, right? I mean, the retarded human is full of emotion, full of passion, full of, you know, feeling. Um, it's just not very smart. And that we have any sense of um, a person. Now, there are three levels of self to consider, the proto, the core, and the autobiographical. The first two are shared with many, many other species, and they are really coming out largely of the brainstem and whatever there is of cortex in those species. Right. Well, look, this proto and this self word is just kind of silly, right? I, I, I would argue, just imagine the, the, the impossibility of having something like a feeling without having a self. You, you, feelings are just intrinsically personal. In, fundamentally, intrinsically personal. You cannot have an impersonal feeling. It's just impossible to impersonally feel. So this self word is just, get, fuck that shit. It's a silly word. It's the autobiographical self, which some species have. I think cetaceans and primates have also an autobiographical self to a certain degree, and everybody's dogs at home. That means narrative, really. So everybody on the internet, you know, the YouTube, they always use this word narrative. So yeah, that's the internal narrative. So the narrative is your past, your, and your present, which is really made out of your imaginings of the future. So you, you, you have memories of the past that are recorded, the conscious ones. You also have a subconscious record that might be quite different than the conscious record, but let's not get into that at this moment. Um, and um, yeah, you have this 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 projection of of a uh, desirable uh, future, uh, a future that will gain you something, strategies and um, a projection of what would be um, a good idea to have as a future. Have an autobiographical self to a certain degree, but. The novelty is here. The autobiographical self is built on the basis of past memories 
and memories of our, the plans that we have made. It's the lived past and the anticipated future. And the autobiographical self has prompted extended memory, reasoning, imagination, creativity, and language, and out of... Okay, so these are interesting words, right? Extended memory. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, you know, I would argue, like I said, your memories are things that have to get into your consciousness. So you have a conscious memory. But tied to these memories are also your subconscious states. So that's how come you have a psychology. So that's where you can end up like phobic or something, is because your actual memories might be perfectly okay, they're not terrible, but you have a subconscious memory that has recorded some huge trauma, and that huge trauma is being tied to this memory. And that's creating in you some sort of great you know, reason to have a reflex of, of, of uh, a reaction. So, I mean, things like vertigo. It might be interesting to hear this guy explain vertigo um, because that's one of those subtle things. It's a thing that's happening not in your, not in your real memory. Your conscious memory won't, give, won't, won't explain to you your vertigo. You have to look to your subconscious memory to find out why. Why, why your body now has a conditioned reaction um, that is so... Um, unuseful. Uh, not only that it's unuseful, but that it is unintuitive. You can't see why. You never fell off a bridge. You never did anything. There's no reason you can see in your past to explain why all of a sudden heights become a problem. You get it? Well, maybe you get it. Uh, reasoning. Well, duh. Uh, that's just logic, right? That's just adding 2 plus 2 adding categories to categories. So, you, so, so reasoning is just math. And what you're basically doing is just labeling things based on their properties. So when things have certain properties, you put them in certain categories. So when something is has two-ness, you put it in the two category. When something has hotness, you put it in the hot category. Not, not that complicated. Imagination, well, yeah, uh, that's just running models. So you have a, it's like you have a you have a construct of how the weather works and your brain creates computer models. It runs the clouds ahead of time to try to figure out where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And so your brain anticipates based on the model it constructs. Uh, creativity is just a completely bullshit word, but I mean it's just basically mixing the model. It's taking your imagination and saying, what if I made the clouds out of lead? <laughs> yeah, so you can your brain can sit there and just, in, 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 through programming, say, let's mix it up. And so it comes up with ways to mix it up. They're not arbitrary or ambiguous or erroneous. They are part of your programming. But we call it creativity when all it really is is mixing up your imagination. And then obviously language is just a vocabulary used to do the reasoning thing. So language really should be just tied to reasoning because language is basically the definition of the numbering system, whether it's 10 base or 8 base or binary, you know, it's just the form of um, mathematics, you know, the form of the numerology you're using to define the values. And that's all language is. Language is just the words you give to the categories. That came the instruments of culture religions, justice, trade. Okay, instruments of culture, right? So, so he's big on this word culture. And all that is is conditioning, right? I mean, we're just maturated by a culture, but that's all it is. I mean, culture can, you can be stranded on a desert island and your culture can be very personal to the people that, you know, you were on the island with, you know, family Robinson or something. So you learn how to be a Robinson, but you're not going to learn much else, right? Um, so, so it just really has to do with, with you, you know, what's, what's, what institutions and what um, habits and traditions um, will um, be your first influences. So, so they're going to be your tendencies unless there's something about those tendencies that you realize to be abhorrent or wrong and then you reject them. So you reject things like religion. You understand justice as being about deterrence. Um, trade, you understand that capitalists suck ass. Um, the arts, you understand this is pretty much just entertainment. <laughs> it's just kind of a waste of time. Uh, science, you understand that this is good, but as long as scientists are egomaniacal, personal, self-aggrandizing motherfuckers, it's not going to mean much. And technology means, well, you're all going to get nuked in the end because you can't handle technology. 
you can't handle the truth and you can't handle technology. That's what human beings have proven. They can't handle the truth and they can't handle technology. The art, science, technology. And it is within that culture that we really can get, and this is the novelty, something that is not entirely set by our biology. It is developed in the cultures. It developed in collective... Yeah, it's called memes, right? So then we're just back to Dawkins, okay? So now it's about the software, all right? The hardware evolved for hundreds of millions of years, and now the software is evolving, okay? And that's what culture is. Culture is fucking Windows. I mean, culture is, you know, Apple and Tiger and Jaguar and whatever the fuck operating systems they run. That's cult culture is, uh, you know, even that whatever one, you know, the, the Nabunto or whatever it is, Nabuto or whatever. Um, yeah, so like that's the culture of the anti. And, uh, you know, Microsoft is the culture of the I'm too cheap to pay for that expensive shit. And I actually want something that might possibly work for cheap. And Apple is, you know, the extraordinarily stupid morons. Um, <laughs> you know, computers for people who want to burn their money. Um, but anyway, that's that's a that's a editorial comment. Ignore that, please. Um, but again, so so culture is just mush. Culture is just absolute bullshit. We see how arbitrary culture is. Those books, I got five hundred and some of them. Those books are full of different cultures, and they're all fucking fucktarded in one way or another. Just fucktarded. I mean, they do stupid, idiotic shit. They, 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 they knock out their teeth. They drill holes in their skin. Uh, they uh, tie up their penises. They jump from fucking towers. You know, bungee jumping was invented by assholes, you know, thousands of years ago. <laughs> yeah, to test their bravery. Retards. But anyway, let's, let's play some more. I mean, really, it was actually invented by, it's, it's a native um, um, cultural um, bullshit. They would build a fucking bamboo tower, tie vines to themselves, and then jump off the tower. I mean, it was just fucking idiotic. ...of uh, human beings, and this is, of course, the culture where we have developed something that I like to call sociocultural regulation. Social culture regulation. So again, it's just programming. Okay, so that's all that is. Social regular regulation programming. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're just Borg. Borg, 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 Borg. And the fact is that culture is rigidly evolving. Just like anything else, its evolution is rigid. It, it has to take the steps incrementally. You have to go from Edison to Einstein. You have to incrementally build the culture... So it's all a, a big, slow, draggy process. There's no shortcuts. There really isn't, unfortunately. I mean, everything has to be obvious before it can be even obvious, right? I mean, Darwin was basically proving a philosophy that his grandfather was espousing, you know, a hundred years before him, him. And finally, you could rightly ask, why care about this? Why care if it is the brainstem or the cerebral cortex and how this is made? Three reasons. First, curiosity. Prime oh, disgusting. That's one of the most disgusting of reasons. That's Antikantavad's re number one reason for everything is silly curiosity. You're in the middle of a bloodbath. You're in the middle of a horror. You just described a guy who's lost his capacity to interact with the world at all. His consciousness is trapped in his fucking rotting, decomposing body. And you're going to talk about how you're, you're oh, I'm just curious. I just want to look around. Uh, ah. ...are extremely curious, and humans most of all. And... If we are in well, that's not a good reason, right? Because you're biologically curious, because it's built into you. I mean, if we figure out that curiosity killed the cat, maybe we should figure out that maybe curiosity might kill the human too. Maybe we should tone that down a little bit. Curiosity for the sake of curiosity is kind of bullshit. So yeah, unless we're going to get educated by our curiosity. Yeah, maybe we should direct our curiosity stuff that's going to make us smarter, not stuff that's going to make us stupider or deader. 
interested, for example, in the fact that anti-gravity is pulling galaxies away from the Earth, why should we not be interested in what is going on inside of human beings? Second, understanding society and culture. We should look at how society and culture uh, in this sociocultural regulation are a work in progress. And finally... Well, that's just kind of silly, right? You don't need to study brains to study culture. So I just think that's kind of bogus. I mean, there's some value to understanding psychology and the fact that human beings are lazy motherfuckers. And, uh, you know, if you have three answers and the right answer is page three, that maybe they won't get to the right answer because they're going to go to the first page all the time, you know, like Google or something. Uh, you know, that's all they're ever going to see. Ninety percent of people won't ever see a page two at Google. Um, and so all of that Internet doesn't really exist as the Internet. Everything on page two and, and down really doesn't exist on the Internet. The Internet's really just this big because 90% of the internet is invisible to most people. Well, anyway, that's a whole other subject. Medicine. Let's not forget that some of the worst diseases of humankind are diseases such as depression, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> yeah, depression. I don't think that's a disease, so I think that's a little silly. Um, I really do. I, I mean, I, I, you know, do, do you think he, he's qualified um, conference support to declare depression a disease like it is actually a disease that I mean I've seen you know cheetahs get depressed you know I've seen the film of them being depressed and they spend three three days in a cave because they're depressed <laughs> you know um, it's certainly a natural phenomenon and it exists for a reason and it probably exists for the reason that there's no point to just points where the organism needs to just go find somewhere and go to sleep because, yeah, they're just not in the game. The game is too stupid. Um, but to call it disease, I mean, that's just, that's kind of lame. I mean, we have a lot of reasons to be depressed. A lot of fucking goddamn reasons to be depressed. The fact that this guy can talk about some guy trapped inside of his brain and not able to access his body and not find that a little bit depressing, I would say maybe he has the disease. Yeah, excessive optimism or excessive curiosity. Disease, drug addiction. Think of strokes that can devastate. Well, drug addiction, maybe you know, we could probably solve that without knowing all this brain science too. We kind of know that, well, the drug is addicting, so why not not take the drug and then you won't get addicted? Right, so instead, but you wouldn't tax the drug because that's just silly because people are addicted to it. So what you would do is regulate the drug and then give it to the people who are addicted and prevent access to people who aren't addicted. Prevent them from becoming addicted. Yeah, that would be the solution. Prevention. Yeah. Your mind will render you unconscious. You have no prayer of understanding how the, uh, of, of treating those diseases effectively and in a non-serendipitous way. Oh, it, isn't that amazing? He just says you can't treat them, in, you know, I mean, it's just a non-serendipitous way. Of, you know, like I said, drug addiction you can certainly treat with, with social remedy. I mean, come on, we can solve that problem if we gave a shit to solve it. If you do not know how this works. So that's a very good reason beyond curiosity to justify what we're doing and to justify having some interest in what is going on in our brains. Yeah, I think there's a lot more better reasons than that. I think I could write a list. If I spent just 10 minutes really working on it, I think I could write a better list than that why it's really important to do neuroscience. So that was a pretty lame defense of neuroscience. Really lame. Considering he had plenty of time on the plane to write something better than that. I'm sure he had took a plane to get there. And I'm sure he could have come up with something better than that. Jeez. Anyway. So anyway, you can see it was all in all a pretty uninspiring load of turd. And he certainly didn't say anything contrary to anything I've said. Right? I didn't see any conflict yet. So... Uh, yeah, on to the next one. The next one is kind of funny, right? This, the other one I saw was was this this thing. This is hilarious. I saw that. I haven't seen the whole thing yet, you know, because it's long, two hours. But it's University of Southern California, and they had the Dalai Lama there, right? And it, uh, these people are just so fucking hilarious. All the rest of the people on this panel are just such a joke. 
And so the Demacio guy is there. And so he makes a good, nice little three-minute thing about what he's doing. And it's okay. You know, it's nothing terrible. And then once they're all done speaking, the scientists, they let this Dalai Lama nutcake start talking. And he doesn't speak fucking English any well. Any well. <laughs> he doesn't speak English any well. And um, it's just like the whole thing is just turned into shit, right? So I haven't got to the real shit, but it's just tedious, you know, because the, little, the Japanese guy's got to explain to him what to, to translate, blah, 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 blah. And he just starts, well, when women love baby child, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, oh, and I'm just, and I'm ready with my thing where I'm saying, hey, you're not even getting it anyway, right? I mean, if I was a Dalai Lama, you know what I'd say? I'd say, uh, you know, when a woman loves the child, is it because it's her child or because it's a child? Uh, does it need love because it is a child or is it because it is their child? Yeah, that kind of thing. Your child. Which, which one gives it the property of lovability, of concern? Yeah, you know, this is a whole ethical thing. Yeah, so I think I'd kick it. I'd kick ass as a Dalai Lama. I'd be a much better Dalai Lama than this douchebag. <laughs> Fuck. Well, anyway, everybody's calling him Your Holiness, which is also funny as hell, right? All these scientists are sitting there calling him Your Holiness. And even the Damasio guy, I guess he didn't like saying holiness, so he said Your your Eminence or something. <laughs> it's like he was the Pope. Oh, so, uh, you know, it was just pitiful. But I mean, this is why, you know, this is what the University of Southern California is doing. I mean, holy fucking shit. It's just disgraceful. Let's have a scientific conversation with the Dalai Lama. Why don't you invite Tinkerbell the next time, jackasses? It's just pitiful. Fuck. Anyway. Anyway, so that, that'll be the next one. And then we'll do some of this whatever. What is this thing called mind? Well, that one might be interesting, right? So, yeah, we'll go to that one next, maybe. Anyway, till next time and such. I guess this will be the, the, the Demacio hour. It was almost an hour, right? No, no. 31 minutes, that's good. It's only a half hour. Cool. Oops, camera. Anyway, till next time.